There are a lot of great wrestlers throughout history who have gotten their rightful due for what they're capable of. Just look at names like Ric Flair, Steve Austin, or John Cena if you need any evidence of this. That said, there are also plenty of performers who never seem to get their credit in the same way. So let's rectify this today by shining some spotlight on the performers who deserve it in Hidden Gems, WWE's Most Underrated Wrestlers. And if we're going to start anywhere, why not do so with one of the most underrated performers of all time, and that's none other than William Regal. Sure, the Staffordshire native is highly regarded amongst his peers. In fact, if you wanted to, you could argue he really is the most prominent example of a wrestler's wrestler. That said, as far as fans are concerned, he's never really been held up on that same level as other A-tier stars of the past. Why is this? Well, while his skills have always been amazing, he wasn't always presented as a main event act during his time in both WCW and WWE. And because of that then, many were conditioned to see him as more of a mid-card player in general. But anyone who thinks this would be wrong, because in truth, Regal is one of the best to ever lace up a pair of boots. So good in fact that he's become an inspiration and a mentor to the likes of the greatest wrestler alive, Brian Danielson. Yes, when it comes down to it, there are few who have ever been able to match what he does in the ring, as with his hard-hitting European style and his crisp professionalism, he manages to make everything look like a killing blow. And these are abilities which even saw him briefly threaten to ascend to the main event scene in New York during the late 2010s, up until the point his substance abuse problems put a stopper on such a movement that was. If he'd won the world title at this time, would his legacy have been different? Maybe for the general public but the fact remains, he was always going to be considered a legend by people within the industry regardless. Hell, so respected is he that even his temporary home of AEW still honor him today by having the faction he helped to start continue to be named the Blackpool Combat Club in his absence. Of course, AEW is no stranger to having underrated legends on the roster though, because while William Regal might have since returned to WWE, Dustin Rhodes remains in Jacksonville, showing everyone how good he is. Now it's easy to look at the Rhodes family and see the eldest son as being the least successful of the trio. After all, his dad Dusty is a former NWA Worlds Champion and a multiple time Hall of Famer, and his brother Cody is a WrestleMania main eventer and a founding father of All Elite Wrestling. That said, for as impressive as these achievements are, it doesn't change the fact that Dustin remains probably the best in-ring performer of the bunch. Even to this day, in fact, at 54 years old, he's still able to show up most of his younger counterparts whenever he hits the ring as he continues to move like a man 20 years his junior. And let's not forget the new ground he was able to break back in the 90s when he first introduced the Gold Dust character. Something so out there for the time, it's since considered by some to be the first real spark of the Attitude Era. That's right, if it were not for the Texas native being willing to push the boat out with such a big swing, we might never have progressed to the levels we reached from 1998 onwards. So given his character and in-ring work have both been so great then, it's easy to see why he's considered to be underrated. But even then, he may not be the most underrated performer of the Attitude Era, because this honor might very well go to X-Pac instead. Ah, uh, Sean Waltman. Where to start with the way fans felt about him at the turn of the millennium? Really, the response he got from crowds was so vicious that a new term had to be created to describe it, X-Pac Heat. But why was he so hated? Well, to be fair, that was all to do with his character of a greasy heel designed to grate on people's nerves, perhaps working a little too well. What it most certainly wasn't, though, was a result of his in-ring work, as throughout his entire career, Waltman has consistently been one of the best out there. Hell, during the mid-90s, he was so trusted and respected by WWF that he was pretty much used as the measuring stick for any new signees. Basically, if you needed to prove you could go, you stepped in the ring with X-Pac, and if you could keep up with him, then you were all good. And it's skills like that which have seen him work for pretty much every major promotion out there over the past couple of decades, with him continuing to thrive every time he stepped into a new ring. Sure, at this point, he's effectively retired, but he can always rest easy at night knowing what he did while he was active was enough to make him a legend forevermore. And the same can be said for another of his turn of the millennium peers as it happens, though in the case of Christian, he's still got a little bit of gas left in the tank yet. How do we know this? Well, if you tune into AEW on any given week, you're likely to see him carrying around the TNT title as if it's his own. 
And even if the belt actually belongs to his client, Luchasaurus, it doesn't make the Canadian any less deserving of the right to do so in our eyes, because for decades now, he's secretly been one of the best in the world. That's right, as far back as the late 90s when he was first breaking through as part of a tag team with Edge, Christian was working rings around most of his peers. Unfortunately though, due to his partner being such a huge star in waiting, it often left him looking overshadowed by comparison, even if he was arguably the better of the two. Still, despite never really reaching the top in WWE for that reason, the two-time World Heavyweight Champion would eventually be able to find success on his own merits anyway. And even when he wasn't working in New York, he was proving to be something of a draw for TNA when he jumped over there in 2005 and brought a whole host of new viewers with him. Sure, you could argue this was a smaller league, but it was still a sign of just how good Christian could be when he was allowed to be. And as it happened, he's not the only one who managed to get a second lease on life in the Impact Zone, as years later in 2017, another underrated star by the name of John Morrison would go there and prove what he could do, too. But then John Morrison should have never had to prove himself by this point, as with his unique parkour-infused in-ring style, he was already one of the best wrestlers in the world, even if he wasn't always recognized as such. Honestly, if you're looking for people from the 21st century who can always be counted upon to deliver in the ring, then you can't really go wrong with the Shaman of Sexy. So why is he not generally placed up on that same pedestal as so many of the other greats are? Maybe it's because he had the albatross around his neck of coming from Tough Enough. Or maybe it's because despite his obvious talents, Vince McMahon never really seemed to get behind him as a top guy. Either way, the end result is the same, Morrison has spent most of his career unfairly dwelling in the mid-card. That's not to say he hasn't had main event runs outside of WWE though, such as his spells with both Lucha Underground and the aforementioned TNA, each of which saw him become a world champion for a brief time. But these achievements aside, there's always been the sense that no promoter has ever really known how to get the most out of the Los Angeles native. Even now, in his current home of AEW, he's basically just filling the role as an undercard act as part of QT Marshall's crew. And while this is giving him more TV exposure, there's still so much more he could be doing for the company if he were allowed to lock up with the likes of Kenny Omega, Swerve Strickland, or Adam Cole. But at least John can rest easy knowing he's not the only one who's stuck in a lower card spot despite being massively overqualified for the job, because back over in WWE, Shelton Benjamin is pretty much filling the same role. And that's particularly tragic as if there were any justice in the world, the gold standard would have long since reached the level of permanent main eventer. After all, as far back as his debut as part of Team Angle in 2002, he was already proving to be better than most people around him. Hell, even before that, when he was in Ohio Valley Wrestling amongst a class which also included John Cena, Brock Lesnar, Dave Bautista, and Randy Orton, Benjamin was able to hold his own and successfully stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with each of these performers. It's just a shame then that this never really translated to the main roster in the same way as despite brief pushes during the mid-2000s Raw, he'd always seemed to end up falling into the background before long. Not that this was anything to do with his output though, no, Shelton was routinely great. It was just that for whatever reason, Vince McMahon was never able to fully capitalize on this. So perhaps that's why as the 2010s rolled around, the South Carolina native ventured out on his own by working for places such as Ring of Honor and Pro Wrestling Noah each of which saw him find varying levels of success. Still, he would always have that bug within him telling him he needed to go back to a major American league and prove himself there too, which was exactly why he returned to New York in 2017. Unfortunately though, this has once again seen Shelton be placed in lower card hell. Just think, if he actually allowed to have the kind of matches he was capable of, then he could be putting out bangers with the likes of Gunther, Johnny Gargano, and Ricochet each and every week making Raw's mammoth three-hour runtime a little more bearable in the process. But alas, this doesn't look likely to be happening anytime soon, just as it doesn't look like our next subject, who's also currently toiling away on Raw, is going to get his due anytime soon either. And given how great Chad Gable is, it only makes this an even more bitter pill to swallow. Seriously, how is it that a genuine Olympic athlete has been so badly botched by WWE that as it stands today, he's pretty much stuck in mid-card purgatory forever? Would this kind of thing ever have happened to Kurt Angle or even Gable Steveson? The answer to that latter question is no, of course, but then neither of those men are as short as Chad is. And if you work for Vince McMahon, then having your height start with five is pretty much a death sentence. Yes. 
for committing the cardinal sin of not being tall. Chad Gable has seen his time in New York be characterized by a great NXT tag team run, followed by a spell on the main roster where he's mostly been treated like a comedy goof. And this is frankly unacceptable in our opinion, because with his fantastic mat skills and excellent grasp of in-ring psychology, there's no reason he shouldn't be a main event player. Really, he should be the modern day Kurt Angle at this point, a man with legitimate skills who's able to translate those into the context of a pro wrestling match. But instead, Shorty G, as he was once infamously known, has had to settle for a series of increasingly bad gimmicks and a severe lack of time in the ring performing actual matches. And sure, it's easy to blame Vince McMahon for all of this, but it's not as if Triple H has done much more with the Minnesota native since his ascension to power in 2022. So we can only hope that it's not too late for Gable to get the due he deserves. Of course, the same could be said for our next entry too though, because while she may not be a legit amateur wrestler, Bayley has routinely been an MVP of the WWE Women's Division over the last few years, even if her bosses don't always give her a push which is in line with this. But none of that has stopped the three-time women's champion from continuing to give it her all week in and week out anyway. That's right, whether she's a heel or a babyface, singles act or tag team performer, leader of a stable or a lone wolf, Pamela Martinez is always quietly stealing the show. Need any evidence of how great she is? Just look at her initial run on NXT, when she was probably the best pure face the company had created in years. Hell, had this character been able to translate over to the main roster correctly, then there's a good chance she could have become the female John Cena. But erratic Vince McMahon booking quickly put a stop to any hopes of this happening. Luckily, however, Bailey is talented enough that she was able to eventually reinvent herself all over again as a villain. And it was during this period, as the world was going into shutdown, that she showed her true worth. How did she do such a thing? Well, alongside Sasha Banks, she pretty much carried the women's division through the entire period. In fact, during the early days of the Thunderdome, you could argue she was the MVP of the entire company. And the reason we say this with such confidence is because each and every week, she managed to make something entertaining out of a terrible time for the industry and at least ensure one segment would be worth watching that week. We can only hope that as time goes on then, she gets her full due and becomes the last of the four horsewomen to main event WrestleMania. And if she does this, she'll truly rise to the level of the greats, the very same place our next subject, Victoria, should also be. Not that it's her fault she's not there already though. No, really, the biggest misfortune Victoria ever had was to be around during a time when women's wrestling was little more than a sideshow in North America. Had she come around in the modern day instead, however, she'd likely be as highly regarded as she deserves to be, right up there alongside the likes of Io Sky, Asuka, and Charlotte Flair. But in the 2000s, such things were unfortunately not possible, especially if you worked for WWE. And because of that, even if she did put out some of the best women's bouts of her era, the San Bernardino native always felt like someone who was never fully appreciated. Sure, she was a two-time women's champion in New York by the end of her run there, and her time in TNA also saw her get to have some great bouts against performers such as Gail Kim, Mickie James, and Madison Rain. But even that doesn't seem like enough for someone who was so obviously ahead of almost everyone else during her heyday. That said, she can at least be happy in knowing that even if she wasn't always fully appreciated by the masses, Victoria has served as a notable inspiration for the likes of Bailey, Emma, and the Iconics. And this means that even now, her legacy continues to live on in a whole new generation of female performers. Yes, it would be nicer if she'd gotten to have more of a high-profile role herself, allowing her to more easily fit into that legend's position in general fans' eyes. But unfortunately, we can't always get what we want, and if you need any further evidence of this, you only have to look at our next subject, D'Lo Brown, and the criminal way he's been underrated over the years. That's right, it's easy to forget now, but back in the late 90s, D'Lo Brown was a bit of a cult favorite with fans. In fact, at one point, it even felt like the New Jersey native was on the verge of breaking out to the next level when he became the first ever Eurocontinental champion. But then, why wouldn't he? Because as his time with these belts would show, not only was he an incredibly gifted in-ring competitor, but he was also hugely entertaining in pre-taped segments as well. Really, his famous head swivel alone was enough to get him over with fans in a big way. The only problem was he was coming up during the Attitude Era, a period where the talent level was so high, even great wrestlers like D'Lo were easily able to get lost in the shuffle. 
but this shouldn't suggest he isn't still hugely respected by his peers for his in-ring work, just as our next subject is also hugely respected in the same way. That said, when you're talking about a franchise player like Shane Douglas, why would anyone think anything else? That's right, while he may have never gotten as over as he should have in WWF due to some click-related intervention, Shane Douglas has always been a performer worthy of all the credit in the world. Hell, he was the man largely responsible for the birth of Extreme Championship Wrestling in 1993 when he famously threw the NWA World's title down on the ground only moments after winning it. And throughout his time in Philly following that, he'd go on to win the ECW World title a total of four times. That said, the same success could never really be found for him anywhere else, whether that be in New York or down in Atlanta for WCW, but then we guess like with D'Lo Brown, the time period made it easy for talented performers to slip through the cracks, so the fact that Douglas never hit on such a level in the Big Two isn't a knock against his skills. No, rather it's just a sign that he came along at the wrong time. Had he come along a few years later, or a few years earlier in fact, there's every possibility we'd be talking about him as the level of star he deserved to be, a true main event force in any promotion. And the exact same thing could be said for our next subject as it happens, because while he also found success as a world champion over in the AWA, by the time he got to the WWF during the boom period of the golden era, there was just too much other talent out there to allow Rick Martel to stand out. Now that's not to say Martel did nothing in WWF, of course. No, with his memorable model gimmick, he was able to be a recurring feature of the company's mid-card division all the way up until the mid-90s. And prior to that, his work as a tag team specialist had even seen him win those belts a total of three times. But still, given his talents, this was not a man who should have been destined for anything other than the main event scene. After all, let's not forget, during his time in Minnesota with Vern Gagne, he was considered good enough to be a bona fide world champion. So why wasn't he a bigger deal in New York then? Well, like so many others, it just came down to timing, as once he joined that roster, it was arguably more stacked than it ever had been or will be. Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, The Ultimate Warrior, Ted DiBiase, Jake Roberts, Rick Rude, Roddy Piper, Bret Hart, Ricky Steamboat, Mr. Perfect, Shawn Michaels. These were just some of the legends who were competing for airtime back then. So with that in mind, perhaps it's understandable Rick Martel never really got a chance to properly shine during the golden era and into the new generation era, even if he was more than capable of doing so if given the chance. We guess there must be some parallel universe out there where he did shine brighter and because of this broke out in a way no one in management could have foreseen. But that isn't this universe, unfortunately, and so any such thoughts will have to go down as what-ifs instead. And to be honest, we could say the same about everyone else we've looked at today, because they all had the talent to make it bigger than they did. Hell, even if many of them found larger levels of success eventually, there's not a single one who couldn't have been more. It's just a shame, then, that due to circumstances outside their control, rather than go down as the best of the best, they'll instead always go down as being underrated.